Hello everyone, and welcome in or welcome back to True Crime Mysteries. My name's Megan, and today we're discussing a recently identified serial killer who was arrested, solving at least four Long Island murder cases, and he's still being investigated for over a dozen more. But before we start, just a quick reminder that helps keep the lights on, is that if you enjoy the content and want to support the channel, the easiest way is to throw the video a like, share it with friends, and share your thoughts down below in that comment section really helps to grow the channel and is always appreciated. But with that being said, let's talk about the Gilgo Beach murder. State police. Yeah, there's somebody after me. I'm sorry? There's somebody after me. Where are you? There's somebody after me. What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do to me? Please, stop. Please, Mike. No, stop it, please. It was on May 1st, 2010 when Shannon Gilbert from New Jersey got a call responding to her ad placed on Craigslist for sex work. The client had offered $400 for two hours and she accepted. In the early morning, she and her driver, Michael Pack, drove out to Long Island in the Ocean Park community in Suffolk County to meet the client at his home. Shannon went in alone, but Michael stayed outside waiting for the two hours to pass in the vehicle. Shannon had a system in place to keep herself safe. She always let her boyfriend know where she was going, and Michael stayed with her for the duration of the appointment. Shannon was 23 and from Ellenville, New York. She was highly intelligent, which allowed her to graduate at 16. She had dreams of becoming an actress and a singer and moved to New York City to pursue those dreams. And it was there at NYC when she'd been looking for work and responded to a modeling opportunity. However, there wasn't a real modeling gig, and Shannon soon found herself entangled in the sex work industry. She'd had a rocky start in life. Much of her childhood had been spent in foster care, bouncing from home to home. But she'd always been regarded as a sweet and caring woman, with a take-no-shit attitude and was protective over those close to her. About an hour into the appointment and it was reported that Shannon had started acting irrationally. She was suddenly terrified. The client approached Michael, asking him to get her out of his house, but Michael couldn't convince her to leave. She had locked herself in a room in the house and called 911. She refused to get in the car with Michael and was convinced that the men were trying to kill her. Please. No, please. No, no, stop it, please. Stop it, please. Please stop it. Please stop it. No, stop it. Please stop it. No, please stop it. Please stop it. No, please stop it. Please. Please stop it. No, what are you going to do to me? What are you going to do to me? Michael doesn't know what she saw or what had happened in the home. He stated he'd never seen her like this before, and in the 911 call, she sounded intoxicated or drugged, but she'd been sober upon entering the home. Eventually, she fled on foot, banging on the doors of surrounding neighbors, begging for help. All the while, she still had 911 on the line and could be heard interacting with the neighbors, but she kept bolting from them as well. Michael was also trying to drive behind her, still trying to convince her to get into the car. State police. Yeah, there's somebody after me. I'm sorry? There's somebody after me. Where are you? There's somebody after me. Okay, where are you? There's somebody after me. Where are you, ma'am? I don't know. She then suddenly turned down a trail and Michael couldn't follow her. He never saw anyone following her on foot and was frustrated by her odd behavior. He decided to leave, believing that she could get her own way home. The first neighbor she had approached had said that he also had tried to follow her. He had noted that there was a man following her on foot, but couldn't see who it was. When she turned down that trail, the man followed her, and from there she disappeared. And the 911 call ended abruptly. She had stayed on the call for over 22 minutes, and by the time law enforcement arrived, no one could find her. The client and the driver cooperated with police and were cleared of any wrongdoing. Shannon was not heard from again. When Shannon didn't come home that morning, her boyfriend attempted to file a missing persons report, but he claimed no one would file it for him. Shannon's mother, Mary Gilbert, eventually got that missing persons report filed, but it was only after being bounced from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. 
and she claimed that New Jersey law enforcement didn't view the disappearance as a high concern. Mary called every day to multiple levels of law enforcement to keep someone searching for her daughter. It took six months before the 911 call was even connected to Shannon's disappearance. On December 11, 2010, Officer John Malia and his canine partner Blue, a trained cadaver dog, were doing a training exercise along Ocean Parkway in Oak Beach. A new FBI study had revealed that murder victims are often dumped close to a shoulder of a parkway, so that was where they had decided to train that morning. The area had heavy vegetation and that morning was cold, with the fresh dusting of snow. It had made the exercise more challenging for Blue, and Malia hadn't expected him to hit on anything. But then, Blue started to alert. Officer Malia and Blue didn't find anything connecting to Shannon, but they did discover something that would start a massive murder investigation. They found a set of badly decomposed human remains inside a disintegrating burlap sack. There wasn't anything on or near the remains that would point to the identity of the person, and she was classified as a Jane Doe while they worked towards finding out who she was. Only two days later, three more sets of human remains were found nearby, less than 500 meters from the first Jane Doe. They were all called Jane Doe 1 through 4 while they worked to discover who these women were. These women would be nicknamed the Gilgo Four. The women were wrapped in burlap or other materials were bound with either tape or belts. Law enforcement was able to identify the four victims as 25-year-old Maureen Brainard Barnes, 27-year-old Amber Lynn Costello, 22-year-old Megan Waterman, and 24-year-old Melissa Bartholomew. All four were similar in that they were all petite, young women in their 20s who, at the time, were working as sex workers, and they had all advertised their services on Craigslist or other similar sites. Though Melissa was the first body discovered, police would find that she was not the first victim of the four to go missing. Maureen was last seen in New York City on July 9, 2007. She was from Connecticut and had traveled to Manhattan for work. She was reported missing by a friend on July 14, 2007. Melissa was the second victim, who went missing on July 10, 2009. She had told a friend that she was going to go see a man and would be back in the morning, but she never came back. After not hearing from her for a few days, her mother reported her missing on July 18, 2009. Megan Waterman was last seen on June 6, 2010, at the Holiday Inn in Hatburg, New York, at approximately 1.30 a.m. She had called her pimp, saying that she was going to a convenience store near the hotel, but she wasn't heard from again. She was reported missing on June 8, 2010, as her family was surprised she hadn't called to check in on her then three-year-old daughter. Amber Lynn Costello was the last of these women to go missing last seen on September 2, 2010. She was last seen at her residence in West Babylon. In the case of Amber, she had left her phone at home the night she went missing. Approximately the day before Amber had gone missing, she'd had a client come to her home, where one of her roommates would pretend to be an upset boyfriend and kicked up the client, keeping the money. The client was described as a large white male, approximately 6'4 to 6'6 in height, in his mid-40s, with dark bushy hair and big oval-style 1970-type glasses. Her roommate described him as an ogre. He was seen leaving the residence in a first-generation Chevrolet avalanche. The next day, or later the same day, the exact timings are not confirmed by the roommate. The client had asked to see Amber again, but not at her home because of her quote-unquote boyfriend. Amber left her home, and it is assumed that she met with this client and was never seen again. It would start to become clear that the Gilgo Four were the victims of a serial killer. Law enforcement would start their search of the area again once the snow had melted in March 2011. With the help of the canine unit of cadaver dogs, police would continue the search for evidence and remains potentially connected to Shannon Gilbert. However, less than three weeks into their search, a fifth murder victim was found. Partial remains were found of the victim, who had already been known to law enforcement eight years prior. In 2003, parts of a woman had been discovered in Manorville, a township nearby. The woman had been dismembered with a surgical instrument. The victim would later be identified as 20-year-old Jessica Taylor. Jessica is believed to have been working as a sex worker when she disappeared on July 26, 2003. 
she had disappeared from a bus stop in Manhattan. After finding more remains, the search continued, and they found three more sets of remains on April 4th, 2011. These discoveries would be a little different. They would discover the remains of an Asian male, still identified, believed to be between the ages of 17 and 23, approximately 5 foot 6, with poor dental health, and had been deceased for 5 to 10 years. His cause of death has been ruled a homicide, and it has been reported that he was killed in a different way from the other victims found in Gilgo Beach. The victim also appears to have suffered from a degenerative musculoskeletal disorder, which may have caused them to walk with a limp. The victim was also found dressed in women's clothing, and they may have been transgendered. The other two victims found were the partial remains of a woman's head, hands, and right foot. She'd be given the name Jane Doe No. 6, and police would connect these remains to a torso that had been found in Manorville in November 2000. It would not be until May 2020 when she'd be identified as Valerie Mack via genetic genealogy. She had worked as a sex worker and had gone missing shortly after the partial remains were found in November 2020. She had never been reported missing, which is why it took so much longer to identify her. Today, we are announcing that Jane Doe number six has been positively identified as Valerie Mack. Mack's torso was discovered by hunters in some woods near Manorville, Long Island in November 2000. She was last seen in Port Republic, New Jersey, 181 miles away from Manorville. 11 years later, Mack's other remains turned up on Ocean Parkway during the Gilgo Beach investigation. The FBI put Jane Doe's DNA into a public genealogy site and investigators found Valerie Mack's aunt. Investigators learned Mack had a son, now in his 20s, and that her life was a sad one. Separated from her parents at a young age, she was moved around in foster care and ultimately adopted. Before her death, she had three prostitution arrests. The last set of remains found on April 4th were located very close to Valerie Mack, and have yet to be identified. The remains were of a child aged between 18 to 24 months with an unknown cause of death. However, the toddler had been wrapped in a blanket and showed no visible signs of trauma, unlike the other victims. Along with the blanket, she was also wearing gold earrings and a gold necklace. She was given the name Baby Jane Doe. On the morning of April 11, 2011, police found two more partial sets of remains further down the Ocean Parkway, closer to Jones Beach. One of the sets of remains matched partial remains found on Fire Island, New York in 1996. Fire Island Jane Doe is also known as Jane Doe No. 7, and she is the most recently identified victim, with law enforcement announcing the discovery of her identity in August 2023. Fire Island Jane Doe is Karen Vergata, who has been missing since 1996, making her one of the oldest victims. She had gone missing from Manhattan, and it is believed that she had been working as a sex worker when she disappeared. Uh, Ms. Vergata went missing at approximately um, February 14th, uh, 1996. At the time, she lived on West 45th Street in Manhattan and was believed to be working as an escort at the time of her disappearance. Uh, there was no missing persons complaint filed at the time of that disappearance. The second set was originally not tied to this investigation, but in 2016, authorities announced that they had matched the remains to a Jane Doe found in June 1997 in Lakeview, New York. Those remains were found in a large green Rubbermaid container. She had a visible tattoo of a peach, and she was given the name Peaches Jane Doe. Also at this time, they were able to confirm that Peaches was the mother of baby Jane Doe, found on April 4, 2011. Peaches Jane Doe, Baby Jane Doe, and the unidentified Asian person have yet to be identified. All the while, while this investigation was still ongoing, the search for Shannon Gilbert was still happening. Police and experts started to theorize whether the same person had killed all ten victims. They were all disposed of in the same general area, but they didn't have all the same M.O., meaning that some were partial remains spread out in multiple places, while others were intact, wrapped, and bound. Some would start to speculate that there were other killers who coincidentally all chose the same dumping ground 
dispose of their victims. Others would theorize that the killer had aged and was not physically able to dispose of his victims the same way he had in the past. However, it could just be a matter of changing tactics to throw off law enforcement. We know that the Green River Killer would change up his method of disposal. He had tried to create random signatures to throw off detectives and even staged bodies. But perhaps it's even a simpler explanation. Perhaps because it had taken law enforcement so long to find any of these victims, perhaps the killer didn't feel he needed to go through the much longer process of disposal than the first victim seemed to have had. Though the Gilgo Four were the first discovered, they were the last victims. The victims found later had been killed years prior. In December 2011, a year after the Gilgo Four had been discovered, police would finally find the remains of Shannon Gilbert. Her death would initially be considered inconclusive, and authorities have first announced that they believe she may have died by accident and is not connected to the other 10 homicides. The theory had been that she'd gotten lost in the marsh and either drowned or died from exposure. Her body had been discovered in a marsh about half a mile from the path that she had last been seen on. A week before her body was found, some clothing had been found nearby, and they were able to tie the clothing to Shannon. However, that conclusion didn't sit well with the family of Shannon, who requested a second opinion. Firstly, law enforcement had been out there less than an hour after the 911 call the night that Shannon had disappeared. They didn't report any sign of her. Secondly, her clothing was found separately, and her bra had been cut cleanly between the cups. Lastly, the second autopsy revealed her hyoid bone had been punctured. That, along with the position of the body when it was found, led the second medical examiner to determine that Shannon had been strangled to death violently making her murder similar to the other victims. Mary Gilbert was hailed as a hero for hounding law enforcement to search for Shannon. As it had been that search, that had led to the discovery of almost a dozen murder victims. Unfortunately, Mary was killed in 2016 by her other daughter, Sarah, who had been experiencing a severe mental health episode. After the discovery of Shannon Gilbert's body, the press would report an outrage from people accusing law enforcement of not caring about all these missing people simply because they were sex workers. Then in 2016, the Suffolk County Police Chief James Burke was charged with multiple civil rights violations and conspiracy. It was discovered that Burke, a police officer since 1980, would arrest sex workers to take advantage of them while on duty and in uniform. He was caught physically assaulting a suspect in custody, and he was found to be attempting to cover up his crimes once he was caught and also threatening witnesses. Prior to his dismissal, he'd been the head of the Gilgo Beach murder investigations and for years had been actively blocking the FBI from aiding in the investigation. After Burke was convicted, the FBI took over. New tonight, now disgraced former Suffolk County Police Chief James Burke was arrested again. The 58-year-old was taken into custody this morning at Vietnam Veterans Memorial Park in Farmingville. Prosecutors say he solicited sex and exposed himself at the public park. Charges include offering a sex act, public lewdness, and indecent exposure. As far as suspects, there had been few leads. A profile had been released by the FBI, saying they were looking for a likely white male at the beginning of his killings. He would have been in his mid-20s to mid-40s, and they stated that this man would be very familiar with the south shore of Long Island and wouldn't stand out among residents. Many of the victims had been disposed of in burlap sacks, and access to burlap was noted as a possible route for identification. They also theorized that this man may have intimate knowledge of police techniques which had helped him evade capture. The profile also explored the possibility of multiple killers. Over the years, there has been some speculation about who may have committed these crimes. John Bittrolf was convicted of murder in 2017 for the deaths of two sex workers in Suffolk County. He lived in the area and was an avid hunter and a carpenter by trade. Experts felt that both skills could have been utilized in the disposal of the victim's bodies. He was also connected to one of the victims, Melissa Barthelemy. One of his murder victim's daughters was best friends with Melissa, and that Melissa was said to have had a client in Manorville where Bitrolf resided. 
and it was speculated that he may have had something to do with the Gilgo Beach murders, but no evidence had ever been connected to him. He's currently serving a 50-year sentence in prison and has denied involvement. Though the investigation was slow going, progress was being made. The next update from law enforcement wouldn't come until January 2020, when they released the first round of photo evidence to the public. Images of a belt with the initials HM or WH. Could this new clue lead to the arrest of one of the nation's most elusive serial killers? A black leather belt embossed with the letters HM or WH was recovered during the initial stages of this investigation. Police on Long Island today released this image of initials embossed on a mysterious leather belt found at the crime scene nine years ago. We believe that the belt was handled by the suspect and did not belong to any of the victims. This is the stretch of beach where the remains of 10 people have been found since 2010, most of them in burlap bags. It's called Gilgo Beach and the elusive killer has been dubbed the Gilgo Beach Killer. Most of the victims were sex workers who advertised on Craigslist. It's believed they were killed elsewhere and brought here. The next would be the identification of Valerie Mack in May 2020. Today we are announcing that Jane Doe number six has been positively identified as Valerie Mack. Valerie Mack, who was 24 years old in 2000 when she went missing, she was working as an escort in Philadelphia at the time of her disappearance. Mac's torso was discovered by hunters in some woods near Manorville, Long Island in November 2000. In February 2022, law enforcement announced the creation of the Gilgo Beach Homicide Investigation Task Force. This would be a joint task force with local, state, and federal investigators coming together to work on the case as one. Suffolk County Police announced a new effort to catch the suspected serial killer in the Gilgo Beach murders. Commissioner Rodney Harrison has put together a task force to solve one of Long Island's most notorious criminal cases. The FBI, state police, and local law enforcement will now meet daily to investigate. In 2010 and 11, remains of 11 young women and teenagers were found along Ocean Parkway. This was an announcement from the Suffolk County Police Commissioner Rodney Harrison, who was appointed to the position in January 2022. Harrison said during the release, quote, As I said on day one as police commissioner, I believe this case is solvable and identifying the person or people responsible for these murders is my top priority. He also added that some members of the group would meet daily. During the next few months, police will release bits and pieces of information in the hopes of getting more tips from the public, hoping that it would lead to a killer. There wouldn't be any more major announcements until July 13, 2023, when it was announced that an arrest had been made in the case of the Gilgo Four. Authorities arrested 59-year-old Rex Heuerman. Rex Heuerman was an architect who ran a company called RH Consultants & Associates with their office located in Manhattan. The firm had been well-respected, with several contracts with the U.S. federal government, New York City, as well as the Trump Corporation. He had lived in Long Island his whole life. Heuerman was an avid hunter, known to go on long hunting trips often. He attended high school with actor Billy Baldwin at the Massapequa's Burner High School and graduated in 1981. And shockingly, he was married with two grown children. His office was in Midtown Manhattan. His community had been shocked by his arrest, saying they didn't see anything suspicious from the man. He was described as large, a bit imposing, but no one could believe he was a killer. His wife had said she was shocked and knew nothing of his potential double life, and the two had been married for 27 years. He was arrested outside his Manhattan office and charged with first and second degree murder in the cases of Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. Police also strongly believe he's responsible for the death of Maureen Brainerd Barnes. At his arraignment hearing, he pleaded not guilty to all charges and has continued to state his innocence. After his arrest, bits and pieces of how they found Heuerman as a suspect have now come out. One is phone records of both the victims and a burner phone believed to have been used by Heuerman. A burner phone, or burner, is an inexpensive mobile phone designed for temporary, sometimes anonymous use, after which it may be discarded. 
the indictment against him reading like a movie thriller, saying Herman used at least seven burner phones, phones he would toss after his alleged crimes, but not before taking selfies like these to find his victims. Federal investigators were tracking the cell phone activity to four separate towers around the area of Massapequa Park, where they converged today. But they say Sherman was positively ID'd back in March of 2022, first after a witness described him, then a description matching his Chevy pickup truck, then data listing his address in the so-called box here, Massapequa Park, where all the cell calls were being traced. It has also been released that the killer had used the phone of Melissa Bartholomew to call her 16-year-old sister Amanda with taunting phone calls after her death. The caller said, quote, Is this Melissa's little sister? Do you know what your sister's doing? She's a whore. The caller then went on to go into explicit details about sexually assaulting and murdering her. The caller used Melissa's phone seven times. One of the times law enforcement had been able to ping the call coming from Midtown Manhattan, close to Hewerman's office. Evidence showed that the killer used Melissa, Megan, and Maureen's phones days after the disappearance to check their voicemails. And several other family members of the victims reported being harassed by someone claiming to know what had happened to their daughters. Hewerman's seized technology also showed an obsession, not only with the victims and their cases, but with the victim's family. He had been trying to find out who they were where they lived, and how to contact them. The calls ended after his arrest. Psychology expert claimed that he was likely engaging in these behaviors when he couldn't kill as a way to relive the thrill. Further evidence has burner phones believed to have been used by Hewerman in contact with all four women before they disappeared and in locations where they were found and went missing. Melissa was contacted by a burner phone on July 6th, 9th, and 10th in 2009 before she went missing. Maureen was contacted by a burner phone 16 times between July 6th and July 9th in 2007. Megan was contacted by a burner phone shortly after she left the hotel. The client Amber saw that day before she'd gone missing had also used a burner phone to contact her. Early on in the task force investigation, in March 2022, they were able to confirm that Hewerman owned a first-generation Chevrolet Avalanche during the time of the murders, specifically during the murder of Amber. As mentioned before, her roommate had said that the client that Amber had left with drove a Chevrolet Avalanche. Chevrolet Avalanche was seized from Rex Hewerman's brother's Craig's home in South Carolina after his arrest. They also discovered DNA evidence that has now been tied to Hewerman. Hairs were found in some of the victims, specifically Maureen, Megan, and Amber. These hairs were from a woman, and they had not belonged to the victims. And after going into Hewerman's house, it is believed that the female hairs belonged to his wife, Asa Ellerup. One of Ellerup's hairs was specifically found in the belt, which had been found on Maureen. Authorities have yet to release how the initials are connected to Hewerman officially. A male hair was also found on Megan, and it was tested against DNA from a pizza box that police watched Hewerman put in the trash outside of his office. The DNA found on the pizza was a match to the hair found on Megan. It has also been released that Ellerup was out of town during the times that Megan, Melissa, and Amber's disappearances. She's not considered a suspect, and neither she nor their grown children are believed to be involved in the murders. Ellerup has since filed for divorce after the arrest and has asked for privacy for her and her children. Additionally, at the time of his arrest, Rex Hewerman had a burner phone on him. The burner phone was connected to an email account known in court documents as Thok Email Account, which was linked to thousands of internet searches related to sex workers, sadistic, torture-related pornography, and inappropriate child materials. The email account was also used in more than 200 searches between March 2022 and June 2023 related to active and known serial killers, the specific disappearances and murders of Maureen Brainerd Barnes, Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello, and the investigation into their murders. They also included searches into Long Island serial killers. Following the arrest, investigators spent almost two weeks going through the house of Hewerman. 
The news showed evidence being removed for days. The home was located in Massapequa Park, across from the bay where the remains were found. Investigators concluded their search of the home on July 25, 2023, after the Suffolk County DA, Ray Tierney, who is prosecuting this case, talked about the massive amounts of evidence that was collected from the home. He would not talk about the details of what was found, stating that first, everything would have to be tested for trace evidence, then if needed, DNA. He also stated that the backyard was checked with ground-penetrative technology, but nothing of note, meaning remains, were found in the backyard. Rex Hewerman was in possession of 92 handguns. They found a vault that contained both handguns and other rifles. Law enforcement described the vaults of weapon as an arsenal and concluded that there were up to 300 weapons. He also reported that the house was very cluttered and it would take time to review all of the evidence. Nothing more has been released of specifics found at the home. A sign could be seen on a fence outside the home that read, no warrant, no entry. Ellerup has also made a statement saying that the house has been torn apart, leaving it uninhabitable for her and her children. She was not seen at Hewerman's most recent court appearance on August 1, 2023. It was the first appearance since his arraignment. This was when prosecution put forth 13 years of evidence, stating this was only the first batch. Both Nevada and South Carolina authorities are also looking into links into other unsolved cases. Rex Hewerman owns a timeshare in Las Vegas that he's had since 2004. He also owns a large property in South Carolina, which he often visited. He is alleged to have said that he purchased the property to retire in. Law enforcement also seized several storage units owned by Hewerman. They have revealed that they were hoping to find trophies kept from the victims, anything that can tie him to the remaining murder victims. People who knew Rex Hewerman are starting to come forward with disturbing stories of what he was like before his arrest. One ex-co-worker said that he even followed her onto a cruise. When he found her, he had stated, I told you I could find you anywhere. Officials in New York, New Jersey, South Carolina, Las Vegas, and Connecticut are looking into their cold cases and missing person cases to see if there's any connections. Since his arrest, tips have been coming forward alleging a connection between Hewerman and cold case victims. One such cold case is that of missing person Julia Ann Bean, who's been missing since May 31, 2017. The tipster alleged to have seen Julia the day of her disappearance with a large man that matched Hewerman's appearance. There are also two other unidentified dismembered murder victims. The first is referred to as Cherry's Jane Doe, whose partial remains were found discovered in a suitcase in Harbor Island Park of New York. She was called Cherry's because of a tattoo that was found on her chest. Her cause of death was different than the others being a stab wound. Other portions of her body were discovered weeks later on the north shore of Long Island near Cold Spring Harbor and Oyster Bay. The other was skeletal remains of a woman near Oyster Bay. They were discovered on January 23, 2013 by a woman walking her dog. The remains showed signs of trauma and were wrapped in material that law enforcement has not yet released. Information is very limited on this case, making it more likely, in my opinion, that this one is strongly connecting back to Rex Hewerman. In summary, Rex Hewerman has been charged with the murder of Melissa Barthelemy, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. He remains the prime suspect in the murders of Maureen Brainard Barnes, Valerie Mack, Jessica Taylor, Karen Vegeta, Asian Mel Doe, Peaches Jane Doe, and Baby Jane Doe. We aren't going to know the full scope of the evidence against Hewerman until his trial. The next court appearance is set for September 2023. His trial likely won't be until 2024. The DA is still working on evidence in the case of Maureen Brainard Barnes, including the DNA found on hairs previously released in the bail documents. Bartholomew's mother, Lynn Bartholomew, told NBC News, quote, I'd like him to suffer at the hands of other inmates. Let him receive what the girls received. Death is too good for him. It's too easy. While in custody, Rex Hewerman has been placed on suicide watch. This case is still ongoing. Rex Hewerman has not been convicted of this crime and is still awaiting trial at this time. As there's still a lot of evidence to go through, there may still be further charges. It is believed that his trial will not start until 2024. If you'd like me to follow the trial and the outcome, leave a comment down below.
case update from our previous coverage of the Gilgo Beach Rex Heuerman arrest. Four new witnesses have come forward and link the wife to Heuerman's crimes. Earlier this month, our video on the arrest of Rex Heuerman went live. We had been watching the case since the announcement of the arrest in August and had been working on that video for weeks while more information about the Gilgo Beach murders trickled out to the press. At the time we had posted, we hadn't really thought any more bombshells were going to be announced until the trial, which is set to start in February 2024. But I was wrong, and every week since we posted that video, there have been multiple significant updates to the case. So first, we're going to start with something that isn't really that serious, just an odd thing that kind of stuck out for me. Essa Ellerup, Rex's wife of almost 30 years, has been in the news a lot recently. First is that she has signed on for a million dollar documentary contract with Peacock and NBC. Along with Ellerup, their two children, both in their 20s, and their lawyers involved have been reported to have signed six-figure contracts with the news network. Ellerup has also been attending court appearances with the documentary crew in tow. She's also made a few statements to the media. One was asking for their guns back from forensics. Another has been vague support of Heuerman and kind of an odd statement that she had only recently filed for divorce in an attempt to shield herself from future lawsuits. In connection with that statement, Heuerman has signed over all of their properties to Ellerup in full, which seemed to be a way of protecting their assets. So now into the more serious updates. The Suffolk County District Attorney has announced that new DNA evidence connecting Heuerman to other cases has been submitted to a grand jury. Once the grand jury has made its decision, new charges can be put forward. Next is the bombshell that was announced and the whole reason I needed to get going on a case update. The other stuff was kind of just things I discovered on the way. Four new witnesses have come forward. Two have already signed official affidavits, and the other two are said to be finalizing things and their affidavits will be released soon. In both witness testimonies of the affidavits we have, related to cases Heuerman has not been charged with yet. The first witness is a woman who claims to have met both Rex and Asa at their home to engage in consensual sexual activity. She said that in the 90s, she had been dating a man who liked to swing. She said that while they had been together, they often went to swingers clubs in New York and were also active in a message board, which allowed them to meet with other couples looking to swing privately. She stated that her partner had been a police officer at the time, and the members of the swingers clubs that they attended was primarily other members of law enforcement and the New York judicial system. She said that in February of 1996, around Valentine's Day, her partner responded to a private party at a Long Island home in Massapequa Park and arranged an evening with the well-known couple, Rex Heuerman and his wife, Asa. Rex had asked them to bring a sex worker with them, and she remembers the woman as looking like Karen Vergata, but couldn't remember her name. Though even if she had asked, Karen likely wouldn't have even given her real name one of the victims that would be later discovered at Kelgo Beach. She said that they arrived at the home late, and she stayed upstairs while Karen, her boyfriend, and Rex went down to the basement of the home. She had stayed upstairs with Asa. She said that she'd been at the home for a few hours, and she detailed what the home had looked like inside, and apparently it matched some of the identifiers law enforcement had also noted in the home. She stated that when they'd been about to leave, she saw Karen at the window. She was naked and appeared to be screaming for help. She noted the woman looked scared and asked her boyfriend about it, and he said that the woman was playing a game and it was fine. She said that it had been a memory that haunted her. Lastly, the initials of the boyfriend were only in the documents as RW, and she stated he had complained on the way home about losing a belt while he was there. Maybe this is the link to the initials on the belt Heuerman had used to allegedly bind Maureen Brainerd Barnes. The witness said that they came forward when Rex Heuerman had been arrested, and when Karen Vergata's photo was shown as a possibly connected victim. She remembers her face vividly as the sex worker that they had brought with them to the Heuermans' home. 
Though a significant amount of time has passed since 1996, she said that the encounter had always stuck with her, and law enforcement believed it was a credible statement given the number of details she'd been able to recall that matched what detectives knew of the case. No word yet on whether the boyfriend, who would also be a potential witness, will come forward or if he will be brought in by the courts as a witness. The other concerning statement was made by a taxi driver who believes Shannon Gilbert was in her cab following a scary encounter with Rex Heuerman at a motel. This would have been months before Shannon made the 911 call and disappeared. The cab driver stated that it had been late one night when she was asked by her dispatcher to pick up a woman at the Sayville Motor Lodge. She'd been advised by her dispatcher that the woman who had called was locked in the bathroom of the motel room and that the woman was upset. She seemed scared and had specifically requested a female cab driver. She said that once she found the correct room, she parked and waited. After a couple of minutes, she started flashing her lights into the room. Then a couple of minutes after that, she started honking and flashing her lights. After a couple of minutes of making quite a bit of noise, she saw a man emerge from the motel room. The man had placed his arms over his face, but she could tell he was a very large man, white, with a lot of white in his hair, and she said that he had, quote, a bit of a belly. She said that she watched him get into his vehicle, a greenish gray SUV, and drive off. Once the man drove off, a petite woman came out of the hotel room. She described her likeness to be very similar to Shannon Gilbert and said that the girl was shaking and crying. She said that she felt that the girl was terrified. As they drove, the two chatted for a bit. She said that the girl said that she'd met the man off of Craigslist and he had said he was rich and would take care of her. She said that he'd placed a thick envelope on the bedside table and said that at the end of the night, the whole envelope was hers. She went on to say that while the man was in the washroom, she opened up the envelope and it was filled with folded, torn paper. When she asked the man about it, he became furious and started to get super aggressive. That was when she locked herself in the bathroom and called the taxi company. The cab driver said that they spoke of family, of life, and just made small talk while the cab driver took her to the train station. She wanted to take the 2 a.m. train back into New York City. The taxi driver said that it would be years later that she would recognize the woman who had been in her cab so many years ago. It had been when Rex Heuerman had been arrested. She recognized the girl from news coverage featuring Shannon Gilbert's murder case, and she recognized the girl's voice from the 911 call. State police. Yeah, there's somebody after me. I'm sorry? There's somebody after me. Where are you? There's somebody after me. Oh, what's the matter? Are you okay? Where are you going to go? Where are you going to go? Please, stop. If this witness statement turns out to be factual, this could offer an explanation as to what might have happened the night Shannon was murdered. Maybe Rex had been in that house, and that was why she'd been so terrified. We won't know the status of these witness testimonies, likely until trial. Both of the statements will need to go through a fact-checking process because at this point, they are just statements, but I'm interested to learn if they are, in fact, facts. This is gearing up to be a lengthy trial, and if this is how it's going to be before it's even started, it's going to be eye-opening for sure. What are your thoughts? Is there any doubt in your mind that Rex Heuerman is a serial killer? What evidence would solidify his guilt for you? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. And if you see anything you want me to cover next, let me know. But that's it for me. Thank you so much for being here and supporting what I do. I'll see you on the next video. Stay safe out there. Goodbye.